All right, everybody, we are going to get going. So I'm Matt Bentley. You might be wondering, who is this exciting, dynamic individual? Where does he come from, and can I steal his hat? No. Um, today, the topic is music communication. That's a twofold thing. How can we better communicate music, and also how can we communicate things through music? So a little bit about me. This isn't actually important. The main point of this slide is just to communicate that I have equal feet in both the programming and the music world. So. At the moment, I've got a C++ uh, container called Colony. Uh, it's being renamed Hive and will hopefully at some point get into the C++ standard. It's kind of working its way through, who knows. Um, I also worked as a recording engineer uh, in my own recording studio for 10 years before deciding that one musician in my life was enough drama. Um, <laughs> and I worked as a programmer. So I kind of have that cross-field kind of thing going on, which is why this topic sort of interests me. Um, I've seen a lot of musicians kind of get burned over the years in the games industry, and in general there's sort of been a lack of appreciation on both sides of uh, how hard programming is, how hard music is, that sort of thing. So, um, as I said, we're talking about communication of music. So want to talk about different ways of communicating music, borrowing some concepts from film. Um, film music was one of the things that I studied at university, and probably my favorite paper out of my computer science degree, so, you know, go figure. Um, and provide some thoughts about how musicians and programmers can communicate better and respect each other more. So the subjects, we're going to talk about five different ways of looking at game music. Um, just a cool tune, which we're all familiar with from arcade games and retro games. Um, playing the action, setting, drama, scene, or character are things that are more uh, from the film and TV side of things. And they're, they're things that you already know, but you probably just know them subconsciously. So this is just taking stuff and putting it into the foreground. And we're going to talk about things you can only do uh, with games and music, combinations, tropes and music, and communication. So first way of communicating music is just a cool tune. So the early days of games, obviously we had a very limited palette, had a very limited number of tracks. Generally we couldn't do chords. So with those constraints, the only real way to make your music um, useful and memorable in the game was to do melodies. And the good part of that is that melodies are very generically useful, they're very easily memorized and they're very translatable. So you can take a melody on one instrument, put it into another instrument and it's still recognizable. The same is not as true for chords. The main reason for that is that human brain is geared for melody and human speech. So if I play, as a sound engineer, if I play something back in my brain, a piece of music, I can identify, okay, the, roughly the frequency range that I can hear in my brain is about 300 hertz to about 2 kilohertz, so roughly human vocal range. So we're designed to remember stuff in that range and we're designed to remember mel uh, melodies. And that explains why sort of nostalgia is a big thing for old arcade music because that stuff sticks in your head. If you've just got something that's a cool tune, it's got a great melody and a nice hook and that sort of thing, that's great for some types of games but not for all types of games. Most games if you've got a really catchy melody and it's just repeating ad nauseum uh, that's fine for kids. Um, ask my friend James whose kid is very enthusiastic about the Lion King soundtrack. They do not mind how often you play that thing. However for adults we get annoyed quickly so it's a little bit better for non-serious games and for kids games. Um, but also if you have a strong, memorable track, that's a really good marketing thing. So if you think about the Doom 2016 soundtrack, um, there's only really a couple of tunes that are really memorable and really stick in your head, and they're the ones that are used to market the game. The rest of it is stuff that is designed to be in the background. So this isn't a great way to go if you're actually wanting the player's attention to be on something else. Um, so, good example, Bubble Bobble, we all know this one. Can we get the music slightly louder, sorry? Um, so, a good example of something that's really easy to remember and just sticks in your head over time. Um, in terms of remixing stuff, the next couple of slides I'm going to show you are a remix that I did of a song called Tube Electric from the game Jazz Jack Rabbit in the 90s. And basically in the remix I kind of go from metal through to acoustic and then back to metal again. 
but you can hear when we go to that. Okay, so if you listen to that melody that's happening on the high synths. And then we go to the acoustic section. Could still be a little bit louder. So same melody, but on violin. But it's still instantly recognisable if you know the tune. So it's a very good way of getting people to remember what was happening in your game, but better for kids' games. So next approach, playing the action. So if you think about silent films, this is where everything sort of started because the first films didn't have sound or music, so you had a harpsichord player or a piano player in the theatre playing along. It's very difficult to do any dramatic scoring that way, so a lot of what they would do would be playing the action, which works really well for like a Charlie Chaplin film or something that's very slapstick. So an extreme example of that is like Looney Tunes music, Looney Tunes characters, ding, 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 where every sort of beat, every visual beat is tied to a musical cue. Um, games don't really tend to do that too much, but generally in a games context, the way that we think about it is we're describing the action of what the player is doing. So this is a bit more in it, obvious in something like Puzzle Bubble or a kid's game. Um, but if you've got a battle sort of oriented game, then generally the music that you're going to have during a battle scene is going to be sort of describing the action. Um, this way of doing things can be bad if it ignores kind of the ethos, the drama or the setting of the game. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, it's actually really hard to hear. Um, okay, that's a bit better. So this is a game called Baby Lead Pixels. Now the background ethos for this game and the plot and everything is kind of dark Cthulhuian. But if you listen to the music, which you can't hear that well, but whatever, um, it's kind of this upbeat electronica music, which is kind of playing the action because it's quite an arcadey sort of game and completely ignoring the setting. And it's a, a really bad juxtaposition. Um, so it's a better example, this is one for, and it's a bit of an extreme case because it's a music game, but in this game you're really using the music to actually cue the player into, okay, what am I meant to be doing right now? So that's a kind of an extreme example of playing the action. Um, playing the settings, so diegetic versus non-diegetic music. Um, diegetic music is music that is within the world. So if you're talking a film, it's something that's playing on the radio, it's something that a musician is playing. Um, that doesn't tend to happen too much in games for positional reasons. Generally the player is moving around a lot, so you might have music coming from a speaker or whatever, but you can't have ongoing music because the player is going to move from that area. So there tends to be not so much diegetic music. There is exceptions to this, like uh, the Grand Theft Auto series obviously is largely diegetic music, stuff that's been played on your car stereo. Uh, but mostly we're doing non-diegetic music. And you can do blends in between. If you look at the Guardians of the Galaxy 2 film, in the opening for that they start with diegetic music that's been played on a boombox and that, and that transitions into being non-diegetic music. You don't see that in games much. Um, but playing the setting in general is, we're not so much talking about diegetic music, we're really talking about, okay, what's the world? Not what the plot is, not what the characters are doing, what is the world? So if you think about a period drama, so say medieval times, so the composer is probably going to bring in some instruments from that time, they're probably going to bring in some musical modes from that time, uh, they're probably not going to be bringing in electric guitars or synths, although, you know, I'd like to see that happen. Um, generally, this leads to the most atmospheric experiences because it immerses you in the game world. Um, if you ignore this mode, bad stuff can happen, as we kind of saw on one of the previous slides. Um, the only thing to avoid with this is wallpapering. So if you think of a high fantasy setting, for example, I always think of Warcraft 3 because the music for that was just omnipresent but very flat and it didn't have a lot of dips in volume and it was just kind of constant so the music just became this background wallpaper that almost wasn't there so kind of don't want to do that. Um, this is a good example of playing the setting so most of the world of Fez is this kind of in the clouds, Miyazaki, kind of blue clouds everything so most of the music is fairly comforting 
um, childlike, kind of nostalgic. That works really well for the game. Um, and they do some very interesting stuff with dynamic music in that game, but I'll go into that in a bit. Playing the scene, you don't get this much in games. Usually it's cutscenes. Um, but if you don't do any of this, then it can be a very disconnecting experience. For example, if you have a scene which is battle scene, so you've got two armies battling, okay, you've got maybe taiko drums and some big horns and very bravado music or whatever. <laughs> Say you've got the same scene, but the leaders of the two different sides are brothers, they used to be very close, maybe one of them had an affair with the other one's wife or something, or killed one of their kids or something and it, so there's a lot of sadness there and they kind of don't want to be fighting each other but they hate each other so there's a lot of pathos if you just play um you know if you ignore the the drama of that moment and you just play the action of dun, 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 it's big and bravado um you're kind of missing a whole bunch of stuff so maybe you might want to bring in some woodwind and something that's a bit more sympathetic in the background along with the bravado um Obviously, you can use this sort of thing to foreshadow plot events and cutscenes and that sort of thing. Horror games do a really, uh, sorry, not horror games. Uh, horror films do a really good job of fake foreshadowing. So if you see a horror film nowadays, usually it'll have like, dee, 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 or you know, something along those lines, something very sinister in the background come up, and oh, it's just a cat. And then you get the jump scare. So it's very easy to predict when they're gonna do that to you. Um, but generally in films you do get some subtle foreshadowing that you don't notice but it keys you into a subconscious experience, uh, subconscious anticipation. So examples Diablo 1, so this is the township. The whole world is high fantasy but what happens in this bit? The sanctity of this place has been fouled. So I would say that the music here is more playing the scene. It's playing the character kind of coming down into the dungeon for the first time. The music is very apprehensious. It's kind of what's going to happen next. It's not so much about the world because we're already in the world in the township and it's high fantasy. So it's kind of playing what's happening now. And as you progress down through the different levels, the music gets more and more kind of dark, satanic, withdrawn as you get closer to the center. Playing the character um, is something that is quite common in films. Generally you'll have a motif for a given character and that sort of gets woven into the music when they're in the scene, this sort of thing. Um, you don't tend to get that in games because generally you know, the character is a cipher for the player. So you kind, of want the, you kind of want the character to be a little bit amorphous in a way. Um, you do get it in cutscenes. And sometimes you get in boss battles, like you get music that describes a particular monster or you know, the feeling of a particular monster, something like that. Um, in film and TV and cutscenes, it can be used instead of dialogue or facial expressions to express what's really going on. So character A, character B, character A says something to character B, zoom up on character B's face. Um, no facial expression, but the music does something sort of light-hearted, ambient, sort of slightly positive, gives you the feeling that what character A said to character B evoked something heartful in character B. Same setting, character A says something to character B. Zoom in on character B's face, have something slightly sinister. This is oh, a system how message. do I go back? How do I go back? There we go. Okay, <laughs> say that again, character A says something to character B. Zoom in on character B's face, slightly darker music coming in underneath kind of communicates that maybe what character A said turns something slightly sinister going on in character B's brain. So this is used a lot in films, but not so much, I haven't seen it in games much. However, you can also have kind of character music to describe an entire race or a life form. I mean, you see that in a lot of games actually, or a particular faction, so that's another way of thinking about it. Um, so I'll give you an example of that from Star Control 2. This is a system message from ship's computer translation subsystem. So the music you can't Incoming hear too well in the background. Extremely but. unusual in composition. Translation includes many lingual anomalies. Overall accuracy of translation is unknown. Hello, extremely. I hope 
you like to play. So, yeah, the background Camper music is slightly comedic. So they're one of the funnier characters game. in the game, and it's is it slightly more funny because yet? they're actually one of the more terrifying characters in the game once you get further into it. They're like the tendrils of an interdimensional being. Uh, they're actually your allies, so it's kind of quite creepy. Um, so, those are the sort of different modes in which you can th sort of think about using music to communicate things. Um, now we're going to th talk about things that only games can do with music. So dynamic music is obviously a big thing. Um, I was talking about fears earlier. If you go online and look at some of Disaster Pieces talks or uh, Renard who did uh, the programming for fears, they had a really complicated subsystem for the music. So they had the same pieces playing in different scale modes uh, depending on what time of day. So it might be Mixolydian if it was evening. Um, and they also had things going on. So if you go into an area and you've had the music for it playing for a while, then the music will stop. If you go out of the area and come back into it, it registers the amount of time, so it doesn't immediately start playing that music again. And this stops the player from you know, getting annoyed with the same tune over and over again. Which is quite important because uh, that game used a lot of very memorable pieces, very strong melodies. Um, music has reward. I've only seen a few games do this. Um, it can be good, but it's a real gamble because it relies on your player being a fan of the music that you're rewarding them with. So I've played two games that have used this system, and one of them I was super into the music, and one of them I wasn't. So the second one uh, really made no difference for me. So it's a little bit of a gamble. Um, you can do crossovers between sound effects and music. Uh, Mini Metro is a good example of that. Um, and I haven't seen that outside of games, so, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, all of these three above can be used to create variety, to reduce wallpapering in your game so that, you know, your background music just becomes an ambient noise that the player doesn't really register anymore and doesn't add anything to the game. Um, they can be very complicated and dynamic silence is just as important. Um, I always think of Lord of the Rings because as much as I admire those films and a lot of effort and energy went into them, they're very good. Um, there's a lot of points in those films where if the music had just ducked out for like 10 seconds, the scene would have been so much more impactful. But the music was just omnipresent and it really affected uh, how emotional those films were. So this is an example of music as a ward. Uh, D-Pad, who did Owlboy, they got in touch with Savant, who's a dubstep kind of chip tone composer. And as you progress through the game, it unlocks different tracks. Um, which is good if you like dubstep and chip tunes, which I kind of do. So <laughs> that was really good. Um, I forget what the next slide is, so I'm going to go... Okay. Um, <laughs> combinations. So... Obviously, these are different ways of thinking about music and games, but most games will use combinations of these things. So if you're just focusing on one thing, like the character or the setting or whatever, um, it tends to be a little bit one-dimensional and sometimes inappropriate. But each game is different, so what you want to do is going to be completely different for each game. In some games, just having cool tunes is absolutely fine, and that was the case for all of the retro games, all of the arcade games. Um, so as examples, you know, Fez sort of brings in the setting quite strongly, as I showed. Kind of brings in the character, because the character is very childlike, the music is very childlike. Um, it uses just a lot of really nice, memorable melodies. Um, I think the expression that Phil Fish gave to Disaster Piece um, was basically wanted Vangelis uh, style music but with a chip tune kind of feel which is a very good description. Um, Diablo works in the setting which is obviously high fantasy, they don't really have a lot of super heavy industrial guitars in there or anything um, but they also do a very good job of playing the drama as you're progressing through it. Star Control 2 uses the setting, so it's all very synth and space, um, but it also has a lot of dramatic music, scene drama for stuff for the cutscenes. It uses character music for the different uh, species, and it uses music for the action as well. 
So this is an example of the action music from um, battle music from Star Control 2. And if you listen at the end when one of the players wins. So each of the different races have their own little signature tune that kicks in when they win a particular battle, which is a really interesting uh, way of doing things. I guess you, I'm not sure if you get that in things like Street Fighter 2 or not, but anyway. Um, tropes, so every game that has a new genre, so if you think like Doom or Quake or something, something that really kicks things out of their previous mold, whatever music is in that is kind of going to become considered to be the norm. So um, if you do Doom 2016 and you don't have metal sounding music in there, it's going to feel a little bit weird. Luckily they did have a lot of metal music in there. Um, but if you're doing something quite new, then you've got a lot more options. Uh, my experience of that is that I've done a Quake mod, an HD Quake mod called Quake Epsilon over the years, and it got quite popular for a while. Then I did an expansion for it in 2019, which was an HD version of another guy's mod um, called Arcade, uh, sorry, Arcane Dimensions, and because each of the levels in that one were very, very different, like some were very sci-fi, some were very gothic, some were very horror, um, I kind of played that and I played the setting. Um, and that sort of did and didn't work. Like if you were new to the game, you wouldn't care. But a lot of the Quake players kind of listened to it and kind of went, oh, it's not, you know, Nine Inch Nails style retro industrial, so that's not Quake music. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, uh, Move on. We'll go back to that slide. Um, so this was some of the music that I did for one of the more, I'd say, sort of slightly gothic horror, slightly medieval uh, ones. And it's just sort of, you know, ambient, dark, background sounds. And it works quite well in a setting way, but again, people didn't like that for that reason. Um, more recently, I'm doing another expansion called More Dimensions, and because of the experience that I had on this one, which I worked on my weekends for a couple of years, um, I'm kind of leaning way more into the retro industrial. So, just an example of that. Oh, that slide is... Oh, that's good enough. Okay. Kind of hard to hear, but... Yeah. So, as you can hear, way more sort of dark, retro, industrial, metal kind of sound, and the response from that has been a lot better, because it fits into what people think should be happening. So I'll just go back a couple of slides, if it'll let me. Yep. So examples of unconscious tropes that you probably have in your brain. Um, so first person shooters often have metal music or electronica. Uh, military stuff, obviously, like snare drums, brass instruments, things that are associated with military fantasy often has choirs and orchestras. Sci-fi, you often have synthesizers. It's very rare to see it without it. And sort of indie, very small, lightweight indie games that kind of have an urbane feel almost always have an acoustic guitar in them. I'm not sure why. So you better make sure that you're good at playing acoustic guitar if you want to score those games. Um, now all of these are useful because they kind of give you a starting point, but if you just stay with that, then your music is just going to, nobody's going to notice it because it's just going to log right into that trope. So Doom 2016 was a really good example because they kind of, they subverted that expectation. Like the music was kind of metal-esque, but it was very much its own thing and they kind of gave players something that they might expect from a Doom game while giving them something that they really didn't expect and that was quite new and subversive. So I think confronting a trope entirely is likely to land you in hot water, at least with an established franchise. But if, you know, if you're able to sort of subvert expectations while exceeding them, that's a really good approach. I'm going to ask those two again. Okay, last thing. How much time have we got? tiny bit. So programmers and composers, as I've said before, I've heard about people sort of getting burned on both sides. Um, I think the best thing I can suggest there is learn about each other's worlds. From my experience, programming is more intellectually exhausting, music is more physiologically and emotionally exhausting. 
So it's not so much that one is harder than the other, it's just that they're very differently hard. Um, there are days that I cannot do programming because I'm too tired, my brain doesn't work, but I might be able to do music. And there's other days where I'm like um, too, you know, I don't have it in me to process a lot of sound and a lot of emotion, that sort of thing, and programming is a lot easier on those days. So I think the best way to kind of learn about each other's worlds is to actually get involved, not to a huge extent, you don't have to become a composer, but if you just pick up a door or something like that if you're a programmer and just do a little bit of tinkering around with it, that can really help. Um, similarly, if you're a composer, a musician, sound engineer, if you just learn some basic scripting, some basic or some Python, something like that, it kind of gets you more into that headspace and gets you more aware of what's going on. Um, some more specific things with intercommunication. If you're trying to communicate with each other about, okay, what music do I want? What are the deliverables here? Um, I would say start with genre, subgenres, and bands. You know, if you start with descriptive terms, you give five people in a room, okay, bubbly, give me some ideas of bubbly music. Five different people are gonna give you wildly different ideas of what they think is bubbly music, ranging from the actual tone of the music, the instrumentation, to the genre. But if you jump on Spotify, you know, you kind of got no excuse nowadays. You can know virtually any genre, subgenre. You don't have to like it. You just have to know what it is. Um, another thing I would say is only leave it up to the composer if you are 100% fine with whatever they come back with. If you don't give them any direction whatsoever, they will just come up with whatever they feel emotionally responds to that thing, or intellectually perhaps. And that might be a world away from what you're actually thinking about on an unconscious level. So the more that you can express that unconscious stuff, the better. Um, learning musical terminology can help a little bit. Um, things like timbre, tempo, counterpoint, this sort of thing. Um, and obviously, as in all professions and all jobs, gratitude, tolerance, and patience on both sides helps a lot. Um, final note, so from my perspective, uh, music is one third of a game or a film's emotional depth. Sometimes you want it to be memorable, depending on the game or the film or the scene or whatever. Sometimes if it's noticeable, if you're going, ooh, then it's not actually doing its job because sometimes you want the player to be focused on something else. Sometimes you just want to be subconsciously bringing them into the mode that they need to be in to play the game. Um, how important, important music is depends entirely on the game and also on the player. So as a musician, music is quite important for me in games. But, you know, for other people that I've met, music is extremely unimportant. They virtually don't hear it. So there's quite a wide range there. Uh, but its presence or absence impacts dramatically on your game's overall atmospheric quality and clarity. And that's me. Thank you very much. And we literally have two, min two minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions or if there's any questions that have come back on the, um, the app or anything. Yep. No, I want to. I do want to play that game. It looked fascinating. Did they have a lot of... I would imagine that they had very dynamic music corresponding to how you're getting chased and that yeah, sort of thing. Problem, yeah. Very Sweet. <laughs> uh, anything else? Yeah. Um, well, you can listen to their back catalogue, you know, you can get them to send them, get them to send you uh, their portfolio for starters. After that, it's really a matter of uh, identifying and being able to communicate clearly what it is that you're after in your music. And then you can kind of ask people, if you kind of look at them and what they've given you in terms of their portfolio doesn't necessarily match that, but you think that they might be able to deliver that because most composers are fairly dynamic. They can usually do stuff in multiple genres and multiple fields. Um, then it's a matter of, say, if you're still unsure, you could say, well, could you just like spec like a 30 second piece for me over this trailer or something like that and uh, you know, give them a couple of days or a week or something to get back to you with something. And if they're happy to do that, then you've got a good example and you can go, okay, I think this is gonna work or maybe it's not gonna work. 
Um, the other thing I would say is communicate with them face to face or over the phone as much as you can. Communicating over email and that sort of thing is really prone to emotional error and bad emotional reading. It's really hard to get a good gauge on somebody from email and textual communication. So as much as you can communicate face to face or Skype or Zoom or whatever, um, the better. Yeah. Cool. I think that's us. So thank you all very much for coming. Cheers. <laughs>